Um, thanks very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here again. Um, so yeah, urban buzzing. The grass is always green in the other park. Uh, Eleanor took us to the countryside, Northumberland farmland, farmland country. We're now diving into the tune itself. Uh, urban green spaces, are they important? Well, I'm going to focus on pollinators, but we'll see some other wildlife as well. And uh, you would think, well, the traditional thinking is, if you want to see nature, you go outside, you get on your bike and you cycle to the countryside. And you would be right, because when you're not building, you can't have grass, you can't have a hedgerow, you've got no nature. In the city, we don't have large concentrations of flowers, which honeybees like so much, we simply don't have that. There might be fewer nesting places for, for honeybees, which then of course wild bees, other pollinators. There might be air pollution, well, there is air pollution, to which extent is that important? Noise and light. However, on the positive side, pollinators and insects, there's creation of multiple smaller habitats. There's a large variety of flowers, but we'll come to that. And uh, we may plant unwittingly, unknowingly, a lot of bee friendly flowers. There might be actually some very good nesting places for solitary bees and hoverflies. Less pesticides, and cities are just a little bit warmer, which some insect might like very much. Now, there's growing in evidence for a good biodiversity in urban areas. 2015 saw the publication of what was now a classic paper, Captain Ball with Mark Goddard. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here tonight. Uh, but their title was, Where is the UK's Pollinator Biodiversity? Really excellent paper, they recommend it to you. And they found that uh, specifically bees actually thrive in urban areas, better than in the countryside. Flies and hoverflies, not so, it's the other way around there. There's evidence from other countries as well, Vienna in Austria, um, Aachen in, in Germany, but also the UK. Um, a lady counted 35% of all British hoverfly species in one garden in Leicester. If you look outside from pollinators, you see things like the famous um, peregrine falcons on St. Stephen's Church in Bath. But they're not alone. Peregrine falcons have really taken up cities. Um, we live in Newcastle in a tune. Well, less than a mile from here, you can find wild otters, foxes, they're all here. Cities are pretty good for wildlife. Now, why is that important? Growing urbanizations, cities and towns are sprawling. More than half of the world's population lives in urban areas already. That's only going to increase. So we need to look after the biodiversity in our towns and cities. And that means we've got to look at the green sites. Well, what's a green site? The green site, all sites are green, but some are better than others. At the top, you can see aerial photograph of part of London. And we might have the most well-known, famous green site in London, maybe the world, a uh, centre called Wimbledon. Brilliant, we all know it. Biodiversity, it's love all. There's nothing there, of course. <laughs> You've got the cricket pitch, mm -hmm, there's not much. But to the left is a housing estate. And they got gardens. What's in these gardens? Well, God knows, but lots of flowers, lots of diversity. That's where you can find uh, good areas for pollinators. High potential for allotments, gardens, and what we overlooked is trees. What's going on over our heads? We tend to look down at the ground, but what's happening in the trees? Got to look at that as well. So, a couple of years ago, we did a project, which we're still working on, we're interrupted by COVID, of course, comparing different green sites in Newcastle, and having two uh, rural sites for comparison. These sites ranged in size from small ones, 11 square meters, Pilgrim Street, the Grey Street planters, which you've probably all seen, to some pretty large one, 200 square meters, St. Thomas Church, the wonderful wildflower strip. Here's a couple of pictures. Top hand left, you might recognize that. That's just found the corner. Haymarket, St. Thomas Church, Thomas the Martyr, the wildflower strip. It was absolutely smashing a couple of years ago. It looks a bit run down now, to be honest. To the right, uh, that's around the corner as well, but the other corner, that's Newcastle University quadrangle, which a lovely planted flower bed there. 
Here's the famous Grace Street Plumpers, a very interesting experiment. It's a social economical experiment. But the guys who started that contacted us and said, well, what would that actually mean for biodiversity? So we dived into that and started looking at that as well. You might recognize this. That's St. John's Church, Peter Station. And what not many people know, there's beehives on the roof. And they sell Geordie honey, which is pretty good. And the then vicar, Jonathan, the lovely guy, made this little pollinator garden here. And unfortunately, the bees just didn't even look at it. They just flew away. <laughs> Never came to his pollinator garden. Life is not fair sometimes. Anyway, with these urban green sites, we wanted to know a couple of things. And the first question was, does size matter? And that's important. You need to know whether a couple of small sites are good, or whether you need a minimum size site. Uh, if you want to create good biodiversity and good numbers of pollinators, would a number of small sites help? So is the religion linear? Might you reach saturation at a certain point? Can the site be too big? Or is that a lower site? Well, look at this lovely grote mark in Brussels. You've got the hanging basket there. Wonderful. Uh, but it's in the stone desert. Does it help? Is it useful for pollinators or not? Bit of a complex slide. Sorry, but don't worry. We'll get through it. In the top hand and on the um, lower hand left hand side, what we see is the average number of insects on the vertical axis plotted against the average number of crawling units, the human meat, flowers. What it shows basically, the more flowers you get, the more pollinators you get on it. As simple as that. Simple as well, size of the site is square meters. The bigger your site is, the more insects you get. Seems a bit like taking it over the door, but it's important. It is indeed a linear relationship. Once you start to fiddle with the numbers and say, okay, I now go look at insect density, so the insect per flower, insect per square meter, then how big or how small your site is doesn't matter at all. So the conclusion of this is there is indeed a linear relationship. A couple of small sites are equally good as one big site. That's good news because. In towns and cities, you don't always have very big sites. Now, you might remember that the smallest site we had was 11 square meters. You can go smaller than that, of course. The hanging baskets in Brussels were about one square meter. And I won't tell you where you are, Tiger, but somewhere in the back is Tiger, and she is looking at very small urban sites, one square meter indeed. And she does find good numbers of pollinators there, so we can add that to this data set. <coughs> right, that's the size of the sites dealt with. And that, that's an important part. Let's now look at the diversity of insects that we do find there. And we still got a lot of analysis to do, but I'll show you some of the data that come out of here. Well, let's, do, let's look at this small site, the Grey Street Planters. That's where our whole project started. And interestingly, if you start from early April and you go all the way to late September, you see that which insect you find depends very much on the time in the season. And you see this half in Italy. Then you see that blue line going, that's bumblebees. Followed by the orange line, by the bees, that the bumblebees come up again. It looks like they're mutually exclusive. <coughs> that they can go deep into that. That might be a fluke because of the small data set, but it's interesting. What we see here is that you've got 41% bumblebees, 41% honeybees, and then a couple of other groups. If we take one of these groups by the hand, the honeybees, and say, okay, why did you come to the site? What are you doing there? Well, visiting flowers, obviously, but which flowers? It's a small site, there's not that many different flowers there. The honeybees basically only come from the sage, the salvia. Three different sages there, meadow sage, lilac sage, and the flower kisser. Honeybees don't care, they come for the sage. If the sage is not in flower, they're not interested in this site. So it depends really what flowers you've got there. Well, that's no, no surprises, of course. Let's look at the more complex sites. 
to St. Thomas, which was an absolutely splendid site. And again, that's a visitation over time. It's a multitude of lines. It looks a bit like a Picasso in the early stage. But what you can see, the dark blue line, that's the white and dark tail bumblebee. See again in July. The orange line underneath, that's the red tail bumblebee. So in the early stages of the year, of the, the season, it's these two bumblebees that are really dominating there. Then you see that brown line coming up, second stage, that's mid and late summer. That's honeybees. So it's a kind of changing of the guards. Honeybees start visiting them. And then finally, in the last phase, you see hoverflies coming up. So a lot of bumblebees, 53%, 21% of all visitors, and honeybees. This is one year, yeah? Does that repeat itself over the year? Well, Alan mentioned the dry and warm summer that we had. Let's look at another dry and warm <coughs> summer. 2018. We do recognize certain patterns. The yellow line hoverflies towards the ends. We see that all the time. End of summer, good for hoverflies. Dark blue line bumblebees early in the season. We saw that. Yeah, so that's still very good. Honeybees. Hmm. Ah, honeybees were supposed to be here. Oops, they're gone. It's the orange line. So they have the earliest one, then they go, 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 and they come back again. That's completely different from the previous year. What's going on here? So let's look at what the honeybees are doing. And here, they're flying with Cecilia. Cecilia goes out of power, the honeybees say, right, that's it. Yeah. These are probably the honeybees from Newcastle University or from um, on top of Marks and Sparks. They got beehives there as well. Then later in the season, they come back from California with poppy. Poppies don't produce nectar, but really uh, good pollen that the bees uh, like very much. In the previous year, in that middle gap, by the way, they were flying maybe on cornflower. But it was very little cornflower here this year, or it stopped its nectar flow because of the hot and dry summer. So you got all these interesting things going on there. A little bit about Cecilia, an American native, so it's not a native in Europe. Now, if you were here three weeks ago, Dave Dawson was giving us his wonderful lecture here on, on bumblebees and, and other wild bees. And he said, well, you've got to have native plants. They're slightly better than non-native. And I agree, but I disagree a bit as well. Phacelia is a really good plant for pollinators. Then look at some of the other pollinators, and I forgot to point it out. In the middle of the season, you have lots of solitary bees, and they are really interesting. They're a nightmare to identify. There's 280 species, and they all look like each other. Many look like each other. Um, you've got Alicus and Lacia Blossom, and um, the fellow bees, and um, there's Colitis. There's several bees, very, very interesting. Tiny, obviously, and uh, many of them. You can see the pollen stuck to the hand of that, that fellow bee there. And they seem to be flying mainly on Asteracea. Right, now, let's compare two sites. Do all sites attract the same insects? Well, obviously not. That's St. James's Church on Northumbria campus, and that's St. Vicar's. 87% hoverflies, no honeybees, very few bees. That's strange, they're both Anglican churches, so let the bees say, <laughs> what's going on here? Yeah. Um, so, what's happening here? Well, this is St. James' uh, Church of Northumbria, and I've just shown you, this little square um, bush is a Cotomiasa lucifer. And that attracts enormous amount of bumblebees. You've got Lini and Asteraceae there, which are just swarming with solitary bees. You can't get more stony and small than that, and yet it's a good site for those insects. Now, if you get completely different insects at different sites, that must be linked to the flowers you get there. So, what can we say about flowers? We can have a formal garden. He is formal planting around Solver Park Monument, where Megan is working at the moment. Um, and there you got the bus garden in Solver Park, which is far more 
natural, pollinator-friendly, you would think, now, is that the garden we want everywhere? Well, if you go to Bath or Harrogate, you don't want a scruffy wildflower meadow on, on the Royal Crescent. You can't have that. So you've got to have a uh, um, formal planting somewhere. Now, you've got formal planting and formal planting. Persdelia has been bred in such a way that it's got petals everywhere. Genetically, it's very interesting. I can tell you how that works, but that's a bit out of the scope of this, this lecture. But for the pollinator, there's nothing there. No pollen, no nectar. It looks beautiful, but nothing for pollinators. Right, so should we have cultivated plants or wildflowers? Well, the thing you see there is Sharon Goldberg. You said here as well. And you might remember her from the wonderful 1829 talk she gave a couple of years ago on this very topic, I believe, Shannon. Shannon lived in Gosford Central Park and she looked at this wonderful plant, a very formal uh, plant, it was cultivated plants. And then behind it here is a large flower meadow. And she compared the two and she found that the formal plant was better numerical, but also it attracted more bees whereas the wildflowers had a tendency to attract more flies. Kind of mimicking what we see urban and rural. Interesting. Now, that made us think, what's going on here? So are wildflowers good for wildlife? And is cultivated flowers good for uh, uh, bees? Jamie Bakovic, who unfortunately is not here today, another student who did a really good project almost two years ago where the time was right. In Newcastle, Oosburn, this is a cycle path that goes by the city stadium. And that's planted with wildflowers. Yeah. The wildflowers that we chose. And then you look at the Oosburn meadow, and that's spontaneous weeds, wildflowers that just came up. And he compared that. So what comes out? Well, let's look at insect density, average number of flower blossoms. Blue is the cycle path, that's mesh and planted. Red is the Oosburn spontaneous weeds. Well, goodness. The cycle path weighs hands down. Yeah? Far more insects there. But if you then count the number of flowers and correct for that, um, they're the same. Yeah? So the only reason that the cycle path with the Maddox path flower gets more insects is because simply it's got more flowers. Okay, that's interesting. <coughs> But then it gets really interesting. What are these insects? Well, on the cycle path, you've got more bumblebees. White tailed and black tailed bumblebees. You've got more common gardens, not that much there here, more honeybees. Whereas on the not mouse weeds, you've got more hoverflies and definitely more flies. So again, you mimic this. Yeah? It's the rural urban uh, uh, concept. But here you're not dealing with cultivated plants, it's wild herbs, but plants that we chose. So, oh, yeah, I forgot that this was in there. Anyway, <laughs> so, de gustibus non disputandumis, you can't twist about tastes. Uh, whenever we plant something, we choose plants. Uh, we happen to choose the same plants that the bees choose. We like cardinal. Uh, if possible, there's a sweet aroma. Zygomorphic, posh word for one plane of, of symmetry. We don't seem to be too keen on hoverfly flowers, which are normally white. They don't smell very nice, they often smell a bit like we, and have a different shape. Yeah? So, oh, love that flower, but the hoverfly is not interested. I'm going to skip this for the sake of time, but uh, <laughs> don't worry, Federica's got three of them, so you, know. <laughs> you will get them, and I'm going to reach the end. So, urban green site, the good news is promising, you don't need to have a huge site, every small site helps. Yeah. Which flowers? Well, in a good rabbinical fashion, answer that was a question back. Which insects do you want to attract? We live in the times of EDI, equality, diversity, and insects. So, which insects do you want? Do you want bees, or hoverflies, or both? You have to adapt your planting scheme to what you want to attract there. Now, and of course, important, and every beekeeper knows that, you need to have flowering plants throughout your whole season. 
There's other aspects, of course, we didn't talk about nesting places, other ecological aspects. There's more to it than just this, and we realize that. So finally, a big thank you to Shannon and, and Jamie, uh, and I forgot to be out there, Marika and, and Molly here as well. Matthew Pound, my colleague, a good TV tonight, Catherine and Mark, the BBTA, who funded a large part of this project, and all our um, flying friends as well, of course. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So what does it mean in this case, uh, competition, and when this kind of negative effect of honeybee can, honeybee, sorry, can uh, occur uh, in city? Uh, as I say, when the density of honeybee is high, uh, or when, for example, the flora that we have uh, and uh, its composition is not uh, um, diverse enough or uh, the quantity is not enough uh, uh, to uh, produce pollen and nectar that can feed all our honeybees and wild pollinators and also uh, basically uh, some uh, study uh, really recent uh, in literature uh, show that when um, when uh, pollinator, different group of pollinator have uh, same kind of uh, uh, f foraging behavior or flora resources. In this case, uh, honeybee can have some negative effect on the visitation rate of wild pollinator. So who's talking about uh, this topic today? Well, there are a lot of new uh, research paper basically come up every day. <laughs> um, I can follow uh, the research production at this moment, because it's a topic that, uh, for sure, it's a controversial topic. So uh, it's really interesting. And uh, the debate uh, between researchers is really active and uh, keep going in these days. But also, there are some evidence that this concern is growing also between uh, the general public. There are, for example, uh, newspapers that talk about the effect of honeybee, or there are associations that uh, express their concern about um, these, uh, these topics. So uh, basically, uh, inside of this frame is um, include my research topic. And uh, I'm trying uh, in this uh, year and this following year to reply to some uh, ecological and social questions linked to basically the density of the honeybee and which uh, uh, effect they can have on uh, wild pollinator uh, in different urban context. Uh, if uh, uh, the density of honeybee can have some effect uh, on the honey production and basically on the colony themselves, and also what uh, kind of impact has or could have uh, the um, honeybee uh, new, uh, sorry, the introduction of new honeybee uh, in the city. And also what is the perception of the public, and in particular what is the perception about this topic of beekeeper that are, uh, I mean, our first actor uh, in, uh, in, these, uh, uh, in this kind of project, and which kind of strategy can we can, um, sort of put together to enhance uh, the coexistence between this uh, uh, group. So I, uh, in this first uh, field season, I sample basically parks uh, all around Newcastle um, that uh, I selected to be constant uh, in terms of uh, area and proportion of green area and um, man-made surface in the surrounding uh, area of, of the park. Uh, in this site, I quantify uh, basically the flora resource and the plant pollinator network community that was already there using transect, so basically fixed walk that I run uh, once per month, and uh, basically recording all the interaction between insects and flower. And this is basically what I obtain at the moment. Sorry, they are really, really preliminary results. Uh, but yeah, what we uh, at the moment know is not, not that much. But uh, for sure, uh, bees in particular are the most abundant pollinator uh, in Newcastle, uh, followed by flies, beetle, wasp, uh, and lepidoptera uh, at the end. And yeah, as uh, Rinken mentioned, these are really uh, our <laughs> main results. Sorry, again, a really difficult slide, but research love that kind of slide. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, what, does, what the, uh, do these uh, graphs and plots tell us? Uh, on the first line, you can see the different uh, pollinator groups. Uh, on the second line here, 
the plants uh, present in, in the park, and the line in between means uh, how much visit we have uh, between a specific uh, uh, group of pollinator and plant. The first, sorry, the first graph there <laughs> um, is a park without honeybee, uh, while the other have honeybee. Is, is that so different? Apparently not. So basically, uh, seems that at least in Newcastle and considering the group level, honeybee doesn't have at the moment uh, an, uh, let's say, a dominant position in this network, at, at least in our city. Uh, and when also, uh, when the honeybee density, as in this case, is really, really high, what is strange, at least for me, is that apparently they are really, uh, let's say, uh, focus on certain type of plant. So what we uh, would like to find is basically that honeybee could feed on all the species present. While on, on, the, con on the opposite, we found out that basically they are feeding on three, four species present on the park and especially they are mainly feed on uh, the most abundant one. In this case, it was the snow, snowball berry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm terrible with the English name, but <laughs> I have to be uh, correct. So, uh, and this is really interesting, and I hope to redefine, to better redefine this graph and show you again when I will obtain the uh, identification, so the species level, because with the spe if we look at the same uh, network uh, at different scale, so basically uh, including species level, may it, they may change uh, and give a different kind of information. What's next? So uh, I won't try this year to quantify what is the uh, effect of new colony introduction in the city. I'm collaborating now with Barbara that is here. <laughs> tonight and I set uh, this uh, pilot experiment here in Newcastle. Uh, so I want to basically sample a different distance for, from a target hive uh, um, and try to find out which is the, uh, and how change the plant pollinator network community in that site. And also I want to try to uh, start uh, a social survey inv involving our uh, local beekeeper association to try to find out what is the density of honeybee uh, in Newcastle and Gaysel. So basically, uh, at the moment, uh, we know that there are uh, bee bays, that is an open source uh, uh, data set that tell us the uh, honeybee presence in a radius of 10 kilometers. Uh, but we want to obtain more fine scale and so go uh, at smaller scale and try to map actually the, the real density as much as we can uh, in, in Newcastle. So we want to um, apply, it's called a participatory GIS questionnaire. So basically a questionnaire based on map in which beekeeper can basically tell us how many uh, hive have inside that quadrant. And we choose that scale because uh, we know that the keeper are not that happy to share the exact location of the yard, of course, because a honeybee could be vandalized or stole. So we want in some way um, try to obtain data involving them, but using a certain scale uh, to like avoid to link the exact, exact liposition of the hive. Um, uh, yeah, so mm, what's next? Ah, and then uh, of course we want to try to um, involve all the general public and um, kind of to find, to try to find out what is the perception about this new topic uh, across the city. And yeah, I think that's it. So if, if you have any question, I'm here and also uh, it's a, a kind of new topic, new research, so if you have any thoughts or suggestions, I'm here to, to hear that. Thank you so much.